Hello everyone, it's David here. Happy Christmas. As Matt and I explained on the previous episode, we wanted a bit of time off, so this week is going to be a replay episode. The episode which follows is the Christmas special which we recorded in 2017, where Matt and I talk about our favourite Christmas traditions, our favourite songs, and we rank ourselves on a Grinch scale of 1 to 10. We're then going to take one more week off, and then we'll be back in the new year with Season 2 of Pints with Jack, where, as we've said before, we're going to be reading through our favourite book of Lewis, The Great Divorce. In the meantime, we're going to continue releasing videos on our YouTube channel, and you can find those at pintswithjack.com. We currently have three videos up. The first one is C.S. Lewis and Me, where Matt and I talk about how we met and how we first met C.S. Lewis. The next episode after that, we ask, is faith blind? Is there any compatibility between faith and reason, faith and science? And our most recent episode is entitled The Problem of Pain, where we ask, if there is a good God, why is there evil? Why is there pain and suffering? And since today is a day of giving, why not share these on social media? We'd really appreciate it. But in the meantime... Please enjoy this episode from Christmas 2017. Further up and further in. The Eagle and Child, episode 14.5. Merry Christmas. Hello, and welcome to The Eagle and Child, the hallowed pub of the Inklings. Now you might be wondering, what's with all the decorations and tinsel around the pub today? I was wondering that. Well, it's Christmas. So Matt and I decided to drop in for a swift half and to wish you all a very happy Christmas. So please welcome the pinky to my brain, Matt. Aww, that's more (laughs) touching than you realize. For those who don't know, pinky and brain are two lab rats, two lab mice. I think they're mice. Okay. The brain is trying to achieve total world domination. That seems fair, yeah. Although I would would maybe... Specify a little bit more total Catholic world domination for David. No, I, I'm, I'm okay with world domination. See, I'm actually, <laughs> I'm actually in a tough position because I live in America, but I can never be president because I wasn't born here. Although a conservative would say after Obama, you probably could. <laughs> yeah, I just need to find a birth certificate that says Hawaii. Exactly. Uh, but also, I can't be king of England. I wasn't born into official royal blood. Obviously, I have blue blood. That's just clear. But I wasn't born into the royal family, and also because I'm Catholic, I technically can't be king. I did not know that one. Yeah, up until fairly recently, if you were Catholic, you couldn't even marry into the family. That's now allowable, which means I can now marry a princess. (laughs) Which is good, because any girl I've dated has typically turned out to be a real princess. Um, But so I can't be king, I can't be president, so I might just have to be pope, but I would look to expand my dominion from just the catholic church to world domination in in general that seems reasonable and you don't even have to go through the priest bishop route to become a pope no no we've had popes that have gone straight from layman all the way through i think it was pope fabian he turned up to rome to watch the election of the new bishop and a dove landed on his head and everybody looked at that and went well this is clearly a sign so they made him pope So we need to stage a chance run-in between you and a dove right around the next elections. (laughs) Yeah, I need to start doing some dove training. Yeah, I think so. Anyway, back to the pinky brain analogy. Firstly, the pinky is clearly of a superior height than the brain. (laughs) He's taller. I wouldn't say superior height. I'm a very good size. Okay, fair enough. Second, pinky is considered the moral compass to the brain. So it's your job to keep me honest? That's exactly right. (laughs) But the most important thing, and the best part about this, the episode where Brain achieves total world domination, he does it without Pinky. And you know what happens? What? He gives it all up. I know, right? Because he he doesn't want it without the Pinky. You want world domination, but you want somebody to share it with. Yeah. That's so sweet. Exactly. (laughs) So essentially what we're saying is you could do this podcast and dominate it without me, but you don't want to. Okay, yeah, that, that, I, yeah, sure. Let's, that's what this means. When I refer to you as Pinky, that's exactly what I mean. Nothing to do with your just far superior intelligence than me. No, that's purely incidental. Yep. So, although it's a Christmas episode, have you got a quotation for us? I have a very fitting quotation for us, given the holidays. 
It's from Mere Christianity, which really connects with what we're doing. Lewis says, The Son of God became a man to enable men to become sons of God. Ah, beautiful. Very Athanasian as well. For the listeners, Athanasian. Uh, what do you mean by that? So this is St. Athanasius. He was deacon at the time of the Council of Nicaea. But he said, God became man so that man could become God. Beautiful. It's this idea of theosis. It doesn't mean literally that we become gods with our own planets, not the Mormon idea, but just means that God took on our humanity to raise us up into the Godhead. Actually, after hearing that, I'd have to imagine Lewis read that. That's just way, that's yeah. uncannily similar. He probably read it in the original Greek. Yeah. And so with that, cheers. Cheers. This is really good. Ooh, that is nice. Today we're drinking a winter lager in spirit of the holiday season. Holiday, Christmas season. Ho- Christmas, no, yes. No pagans here. We're already, we're already, we're slowly seeing where David falls in the political <laughs> spectrum <laughs> with these small comments. <laughs> Obviously, I didn't mean it in that way. I'm just ensuring your orthodoxy, that's all. <laughs> so in today's episode, we thought we would just chat a little bit about Christmas And so I have a few questions for Matt. And obviously I have a few questions for you. (laughs) So let's kick things off. Uh, What are your family traditions around Christmas? That's a good question. And no, I did not, for the listeners wondering, prep for any of these. I have no idea what's coming. What are the family traditions? Well, Christmas Eve, this is a great one. All right, just came to me. Christmas Eve, we go to one side of the grandparents. And one of the things that we would do as kids is we would go Santa hunting. And so my grandfather, uncle, just different funny family members, we'd all pack into a car, and the grandkids would be anywhere between the age of, honestly, one and up until 10 for some of us later converts to realizing this is a myth. And we would just, we would look around and be like, oh my goodness, I saw it. And, and my uncle would really get into this. Oh, there was Ru- Rudolph over there. Did you see him? And it's amazing how many of us would just lie. <laughs> but there's... There's one grandchild, Molly, who is very honest of a person, clearly, because she'd be like, I didn't see it. I missed it. <laughs> and, and everyone caves eventually, <laughs> but you see which ones cave first. Who, who wants to follow the crowd and be like, I saw it, I saw it, I saw it. <clears throat> and so that's a big one, which one time my grandfather was driving and he was looking and he didn't realize it. And on Christmas Eve, he rear-ended a parked car. So he had to naturally <laughs> go knock on the door. Or he did. I shouldn't say we. Uh, and he had to knock on the door and apologize for rear-ending. Wow. Car. I'd have loved to have seen the insurance forms on that. Reason for accident. <laughs> Pointing out Santa. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of that. That is good. Okay. Important question. On what date do you think it's allowable to start listening to Christmas music? December 1st. Okay. I'll, I'll allow it. It's also it. when I start drinking peppermint hot chocolates. I switch from regular hot chocolates to peppermint that nice. day. Okay. I can do it all year, but that I just consciously make that my day. And I need to in San Diego because in, in Michigan, you get the cold weather and you get a nice slow build to Christmas and snow really helps. San Diego... I mean, people are going to be, listeners will probably be angry that I'm complaining about this, <laughs> but the weather is so nice. Yeah. It's still 75 degrees today outside. And so you don't know Christmas is coming. So for me, December 1 gives me, I know I got my peppermint hot chocolates and my red mugs from Starbucks, and I got my Christmas music. Okay. Uh, so what, what, about, what about you? Are we going through me first and then you? Oh, no, no, no. You can, you can ask me questions as well. Um, December 1st is allowed. Uh, I am a little bit more of a purist, though. If we're in Advent, we should be listening to Advent music. When it's December 25th or 24th, okay, we're now into the Christmas season. Now it's allowable. Are you serious? Two days before? Yeah. Well... Do you have any joy in your life? I have so much joy because it comes through (laughs) self-discipline so that when the floodgates come open, I am the most joyful person you have ever met. Self-discipline. Mine's from cheap music (laughs) and cheap drinks with sugar. Well, I think a good portion of it comes from my childhood because we would only get a Christmas tree a week before Christmas, sometimes even just a couple of days before. And we would first bring it in and then usually on a subsequent night decorate it. So we had all of our Christmas traditions very close, but we would say have an Advent candle. We're actually doing it in our house at the moment, where I'm currently living in California. 
We have an Advent candle that we light each night and say a prayer. I'm so sorry. <laughs> a few days before. It, all it means is when we get to Christmas, I am all about Christmas. I'm watching Elf. I'm watching Santa Claus the movie. I'm watching Die Hard. All of your Christmas classics then just get packed into that Christmas period. How does It's a Wonderful Life not top that list? Um, <clears throat> doesn't have John McClane in it. No Bruce Willis. We're done with this podcast. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> So people have described me as Grinchy before with the same incorrect criterion that you've been applying. So where would you say you fit on the Grinch scale between one to ten? Completely a one. As in all enthusiastic about Christmas. Yeah, there's no Grinch here. Okay, yeah. I, I would... I'm the type where in college, dorm rooms we're talking about. Uh, the dorm that I had was a quad and it had a tall enough ceiling that you could loft your beds. So we had no beds on the floor. So we had a lot of space. I bought a tree, bunch of Christmas lights, hung it all around. We had an entire party where the entire room was lit up just with the Christmas lights. Like, that's me. So Grinch is a zero. And with your beds up there, that just leaves more room for activities. More activities and more lights. Mm -hmm. Because under the beds, you put lights. By the way, if anybody gets that movie reference, you shouldn't have watched that movie. Just FYI. And that's funny. I don't, I don't, what was it? That's the right answer. It's from <laughs> Step Brothers. Oh, I have seen that. <laughs> I'm just going to admit that. <clears throat> uh, angel or fairy or star, what is on top of your Christmas tree? Oh, I never put anything up. God, I, I know. think Grinch that... is starting to come through. <laughs> <laughs> There's just so much emphasis and focus going into the body of the tree. I don't want a star on top. Okay, well, the tree, is it a real tree or is it a fake tree? Okay, it's unfortunately here. I will be a real tree person, but in college that was a lot harder, so it was a fake tree. Okay. Um, but, but I will be a real tree person. Yes. You aspire to be a real tree person. I aspire person. to be a real tree person. Well, you're already pretty sappy, so you're well prepared. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite Christmas song? Or favorite Christmas carol? Oh, this is very easy, actually. It's, it's not a carol. It's a song, but it's the Christmas shoes. Okay, I don't think I know that one. Good. It's just, it's actually designed towards a movie. Yeah, it's, a, it's one of the most beautiful movies. If you don't cry, you don't have a heart. I mean, it's this little boy, mother dying of cancer. I'm not giving anything away. And he, he really desires to buy her a pair of Christmas shoes because she has given up so much for him in life. And he, she's about to die. Might, this might be her last Christmas. And he wants her to look beautiful for when she meets Jesus. Oh and he can't afford the Christmas shoes. And so it's a beautiful journey. Story of him and his love for his mother. This Grinch type guy who starts in the movie at a 10. And then because of this act, obviously becomes a his, lot less Grinchy. Well, his heart grows yeah. several but sizes. This, the song reminds me of that movie every time I listen to it. Probably, honestly, probably a hundred to thousand times between <laughs> now and Christmas on repeat. Wow. Wow. See, we were mocking your taste in movies, but that sounds rather adorable. I, it's a, I'm a romantic at heart. What, what about you, though? The, first of all, I want to go back to the real tree, fake tree. Uh, growing up, we were real tree. Mm -hmm. And then when I got into my late teens, we then switched over to fake tree. I actually went shopping with my housemates. So we, I've lived here now for two Christmases. So we have a family tradition where we go out and initially we chopped it down, but now buy a real tree. And I have a roof rack, so it goes in my car. It was actually funny because... When we went, there were lots of couples with their little children. And my roommates are married and they have a little child. Not too many other couples also had a 30-something lodger that they brought with them. 30-something. That's what I like to say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yes. And, okay, now, favorite Christmas song? Once in Royal David City, for obvious reasons. Got the obvious reasons. No hmm. idea what the song's about. It's about Jesus. And probably another one I really like is uh, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day from my favorite Christian band, Casting Crowns. They have a lovely setting of it. No, oh, I'm glad you have a more lighthearted one. Actually, that one's kind of harsh. In the song, it's juxtaposing the bells that you hear on Christmas Day and pain and suffering in the world. And it's asking the question, do these bells ring hollow given this pain in the world? But it ultimately answers that it's no, it's full of hope. I want to take this moment to assure readers that David is a normal, down-to-earth, fun human being that everything is not deep and intellectual with, and you can have a laugh with over a beer. 
Thank you for that. Yeah, well, for some of these responses, I felt <laughs> like we needed to insert that. Best Christmas present ever. Oh, okay. I have two. One more appropriate than the other. So we'll start with the first one. Uh, my initial thought of best Christmas present was when I got Castle Grayskull. So growing up, and you can date me from this, growing up, I was a huge He-Man fan. I'm not joking. My two great moral principles in my life was what does Jesus say and what does He-Man say? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very formative. Okay, I'm going to stop pretending. I have no idea what He-Man is. Okay, so He-Man was a children's cartoon. It was actually a toy series produced by Mattel, and they made stories to sell the toys. So this was really good consumerism back in the 80s. He-Man had sort of a Clark Kent Superman idea. So he was Prince Adam, weak. And then when he raises aloft his magic sword, he transforms into He-Man, who is strong and has a good, deep voice. And he's super strong, and Grayskull is the place where he was first transformed into He-Man. Is looked after by the sorceress, and there are only a few other people that know his secret identity. And he battles this bad guy called Skeletor, who lives in Snake Mountain. <laughs> and I don't mean to brag here, but I'm a member of the He-Man Super Fan Club. And the planet where He-Man lives is called Eternia. And if you become a member of this club, you get given a secret Eternian name and a passcode. So if there's anyone out there who is also a member of the He-Man Super Club... Probably Amy Farrah Fowler. She, Amy would have absolutely have been a fan of He-Man. Oh my goodness. But if you know it, tweet me and we can exchange our secret attorney names. I really <laughs> look forward to that. Oh. And actually, if you look on my blog, you can find an article. To be fair, it, I published it on April 1st. But I explain how He-Man is secretly just Christian allegory and how it actually teaches transubstantiation. Only you could take something like that and connect it to transubstantiation. You mean take something awesome and make it even more awesome? Yeah, I guess. Sure. Yeah. If you want to tell yourself that. <laughs> but before I ask you the question, I also had a second one. And this one is much more appropriate given this podcast. It was a lion. It was a plastic push-along toy and that had like a secret compartment where you could put things in. And when I was a kid, I think I was like four or five, if ever car keys or money or anything else went missing... You went and looked in the line because usually little David had wandered along, taken it and stored it in the compartment. But this pet lion, this plastic lion, I called Aslan. Oh my goodness. I think, you, I think you've been holding back, even from me, your extreme enthusiasm for C.S. Lewis. <laughs> well, th there, are, there are other stories I could tell of my early love for Narnia. Let's reserve them. I've heard way too many for one day. <laughs> But yes, I, I called him Aslan, and actually as a little kid, I think when I was four, I broke a bone in my foot. Ouch. Yeah, so I actually had my foot in a cast, which meant that I couldn't actually walk. So what I would do is I'd sit on Aslan and push myself around the house. Well, oh, that's a real nice friend. No, I actually thought there was great symbolism on it. If Aslan is meant to be an allegory for Jesus, then... We're supposed it, to sit on Jesus? Well, no, in our weakness, he carries us. Yeah, that's a stretch. It's not, it's not like the parable of the Good Samaritan. He takes the man who's been injured on the side of the road and puts him on his donkey, which the church fathers say is Christ's own body. You, okay, you win this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Touché. So with that very high bar set, what was your best Christmas present? I'm back and forth between... I mean, mine were pretty straightforward. I was a massive Lego fan. Mm -hmm. To an extreme. And so I would say one of two Legos I distinctly remember. One was the Statue of Liberty. It was huge. It was cool. Another one, for a person who's never seen the Star Wars movies, it was the... Uh, the Death Star? Nope. Um, it the was TIE Fighter? It, it was when they just started doing it. It's the Luke's... The X-Wing. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yeah, X-Wing. Okay. Oh, and I actually got two. I got the X-Wing. And it was huge, too. And it had gotten on a stand. It was like a collector's edition one. And the other one was the... the Darth Vader's thingy with the, the, the TIE fighter. Is that what it's called? Mm. TIE fighter. Okay. So I got both of those and, and I believe they're still built. I built them when I was a kid. They were in my room up until a few years ago. Uh, moved houses and I've been in San Diego since then. So I don't know if they've survived the move, but when I used to go home three, four years ago, they were in my room still built. Wow. Okay. We need some pictures and I'll put them on the new Instagram account. There you go. I like that. 
The other one I was thinking between was to make me look a little bit less nerdy. <laughs> rollerblades. I got some really sweet rollerblades from my grandparents. Sometime in the 90s? Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. I think I was six <laughs> years old. So it'd be 97. It's more than 91. Yeah. So one of those two. Okay. So what about Christmas itself? How has your understanding or enjoyment of Christmas changed over the years? Hmm. Well, I guess here's our chance to get a little bit deeper. Well, I've already got deep, but this is your chance. <laughs> to prove my worth. <laughs> Prove you're actually worth having on this for than just funny, silly humor. Come on, Pinky. I believe in you. <laughs> I would say if you're looking at how it's changed, you got to look at where it started. Obviously, as a child, everything was about the gifts you got. I mean, I'm not going to pretend it was about family time. When I, <laughs> up until maybe 12 years old, 14 years old, I just look forward to the presents. And, and not only presents from family, but both grandparents. And you're just so excited you've got three Christmases to open gifts. So that... That's probably how it started. This is delicious, by the way. I'm really enjoying this beer. It is. It is. So in a grown-up state, I guess I would say, and I'm not just saying this to be cheesy. I mean, this is truly what's happened only in the last couple of years, though. I was not like this in college, even. But as my love for faith, my desire for God has grown deeper and deeper, I do truly believe that the Christian meaning of you know, this is the birth of Christ. That's the gift of Christ to us. God became man so men could become sons of God. Christ's life being brought into this world was not just so we can see how we're supposed to live. That death and resurrection, the atonement, there's so much there in terms of the grace that allows us to become who we were meant to be. That's sons of God. And so in my life over the last few years, as I've worked through finding that joy and that peace that comes through the Christian faith, and so when Christmas comes, I look forward to that chance of, this is where it all began. This is, this is where that grace came from. And so for me, I still look forward to the gifts I receive, but now they're the gifts of faith, gifts of Christ, gifts of the sacraments, gifts of forgiveness and the graces of God. That's what I would say Christmas has become to me. Starting as somebody that was a little bit higher up on the Grinch scale, and I blame Ali McBeal here. If anybody else has watched Ally McBeal and if it ruined Christmas for them, let me know. Again, this just shows our age gap. I don't know what <laughs> Ally McBeal is. Uh, she was a lawyer. It was very kooky. But in the episode, she would always get misty-eyed when it would come to Christmas time as being magical. And I, the Englishman in me just has to recoil at such sentimentality. But a few years ago, I decided I'm going to try Christmas this year. I'm going to try and throw myself into it a little more. And my big takeaway from that Christmas period was about the sensual nature of Christmas and the sensual nature of our faith. Let me explain what I mean. Christianity is not Gnosticism. We actually covered this in an earlier episode. The Gnostics said, spirit good, body bad. But that's not Christianity. In Christianity, we read in Genesis that God made the body and declared it good. And if you actually think about the sacraments, go through the sacraments of initiation. First of all, we're baptized, we're washed with water, we're confirmed or chrismated with oil. The bishop takes oil and marks us on our forehead. When we receive the Eucharist, we receive it under the form of bread and wine. When we go to confession, depending upon your right, the priest will lay hands on you or take his stole and place it on your head. But either way, there's proximity to another person. And when a man is ordained to the priesthood, a bishop will actually lay hands on his head. And if you think about the wedding rites, the bride and groom, they exchange rings. And there are other physical things that happen later. But there's this very sensual nature of God communicating his grace through matter, through tangible things. And that's seen par excellence in the incarnation. We spoke about it in that perfect penitent episode the transcendent, ineffable, inconceivable God, taking the form of a zygote, a fetus, a little baby. So I might wait until December 24th to celebrate Christmas, but when I do, I celebrate it properly. And on that note, before closing with our usual sign-off, David and I both want to say how truly grateful we are for you guys and what a joy this has been to create this podcast to be able to share this experience with you, to have you listeners enjoying it and providing your feedback, whether it's friends through phone conversations or people on Twitter, it honestly means the world to us. So we want to say thank you to you 
and wish you from the bottom of our hearts an incredibly very Merry Christmas. Or Happy Christmas, as we say in England. So with that, I think we hear the closing bell. As always, you can find this podcast anywhere where good podcasts are found and bad ones. And you can contact us on the website, restlesspilgrim.net. You can tweet us at Pints with Jack, even if it's just to say Happy Christmas. And we'll see you in our next full episode, which is released on New Year's Eve. When we'll be doing what we do every episode. Take over the world? No. We'll be going further up. And further in. Happy Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>